First one up. Guys, go ahead and put that one up. Whichever one it is, it doesn't matter to me. This is amazing. BBC News. Newspaper headlines. May of Reckoning, playing off of uh, the Prime Minister May's last name, May or Day of Reckoning. May of Reckoning for Prime Minister's Brexit deal. Brexit, if you don't know, is Britain's exit from the failing, catastrophic, doomed European Union. England has, has enough sense to get out of it. They've been trying to get out of it. It's the right thing to do. She has been blocked, stonewalled, stopped, and, 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 and attacked on this move to retain Britain's national independence. Listen, this is important. Britain's national independence is evaporating because the globalist one world government is being born out of Europe, out of the EU. The EU is leaderless tonight. The European Union has no leadership. They need a leader very badly in the European Union. Macron thinks he's the one. I don't think so. But this is just an amazing announcement how disconnected and how weakened the European Union is and also how healthy the global government push and the one world agenda is. I say this to you tonight because if you don't know your Bible, the Bible tells you that in the last days that there'll be a one world governing empire. Very interesting. Next slide before Don comes out. Next slide. World War III, Russia tells Israel strikes on Syria must end amid fears of new chaos. And this is heating up as you guys have been watching daily, literally daily, every day, sometimes hours on end, Israeli sorties, uh, missions into Syria, into Lebanon, dealing with Hezbollah and uh, the attack of and the disarmament of Iranian uh, missile bases, missile laboratories, missile manufacturing in Syria. This is a big deal. Keep your eye on it. This is a showdown. All the while this is going on, the Israeli government insiders, some people say connected to a dark government, is seeking to uh, destroy Netanyahu even as morning dawns in Israel right now. Uh, the, 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 the allegations, all kinds of things going up. Finally, this. Um, I'm going to read you an art, a, a statement from the news. I'm not making it up. Those of you who know Ezekiel, remember the nations that are mentioned in the Ezekiel battle that is going to be a battle in the last days before Armageddon, before, uh, well, it could happen before the rapture, could happen after the rapture, it doesn't matter. Ezekiel battle is very, very um, key. Uh, but there are, I think, only five nations mentioned. And, now, and those of you who know, I want you to hear this. I'm going to read it to you. The news said, Israel and Russia... Count these. Israel and Russia have been at odds since September. While it was aiming at an Israeli jet that was targeting an Iranian installation. The incident which Moscow blames on Israel for threatening to hamper Israel's campaign against Iranian enrichments of weapons in Syria. <laughs> Did you hear that? Back and forth. You say, oh my goodness, that's like a commentary on Ezekiel chapter 38. The players are in alignment. Well, to help us look and understand some of these events in light of Bible prophecy and the news around us, it's our resident genius. He's a gifted man, gifted author. We love Don Stewart, a busy man on uh, his channel television uh, almost all the time now, but uh, God has blessed him, and so he's no stranger to us. Give a warm welcome to Don Stewart tonight. Thank you. All right. How are we doing? Good. Doing great. Don, um, I want you to start. I want you to go for it. You're standing in the river on this. You are in the know. And, um, and so just jump in. What, what do you see happening? And how does that align with safe, healthy eschatology? Well, we only have an hour to do this before the question, but I'll do the best I can. You know, one thing I found, Jack, from the last time I came here and saw you guys, I now know to visit my daughter over in England, I don't have to fly anymore. I can take the train from New York to London now, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's going to be that's happening. Right. So that, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, 
Where do you start? Where do you start? Let's start with a very serious subject, okay? Um, very short while back, Governor, Mar uh, Governor Cuomo of New York decided to light up the Empire State Building with pink because of a law they passed That's right. on basically murder, abortion on demand, to the place now where anybody, anybody can por perform an abortion. You don't have to be even a, a medical practitioner, right, Jack? Anybody can do that. Now, right after that, the uh, state of Virginia wanted to go one better. Mm -hmm. A woman named Kathy Tran, who was a delegate there to the uh, state uh, house, had a bill ready to be passed, and he was, she was asked about it. And someone said, well, is this abortion up to the time of, of birth? And she said, yeah. So the person said, you mean if the woman's dilating, you can still do an abortion? She said, according to your bill? She said, yes. Well, a couple of days later, they asked the governor, Ralph Northern, about it. And he, he said, well, yes, but not only that, he did it better. Even if the child is born, we can, you know, make the child comfortable and then decide what to do with that child. And so now we've gone from abortion, abortion on demand, infanticide. We have the uh, state of Vermont did basically the same thing, which they said in their bill that the fetus has no rights whatsoever. They made a big point of that before they were born. The state of New Mexico was working on a bill that basically says if you're a medical practitioner in the state of New Mexico, whether you have a conscience or not, you have to perform abortions. Doctor, nurse, whoever, you can't get out of it. Can't. So that's where we're going right now, Jack. Yeah. So I know you're heavily you know, involved in the fight against that. So I thought you know, it's kind of a downer thing to start with, but look where our country's no. gone in such a short period of time. But Don, listen, and, and uh, what, what we prayed about earlier and what I said a moment ago, church, listen, this stuff is not... This stuff's not to freak you out. You need to understand what Don just said. We need to remember that God's word tells us that these things are going to happen. And so how do we position ourselves? How do we equip ourselves? And what Don said is tragic, but the believers to stand for truth, no matter what the tide and what the wind is blowing or how the wind is blowing, you stand for truth, you stand for the unborn. But the fact of the matter is, if you know your Old Testament scriptures, you know that this is how nations become ripe for God's judgment. You say, well, I thought this was a night on Bible prophecy. Actually, it, it is. is. It is. A nation, when it conducts itself against God, is setting themselves up for a future destruction. America will have to pay the price for her rebellion against God. There's no doubt about it. But Norman Geisler said forever ago that in in a man's mind, when God, when God dies in a man's mind, then man dies. Because if a man doesn't think God exists, then a man's going to turn around and kill someone. So if God is dead in the conscience of a nation, then what's wrong with what Vermont's doing? Don, what's wrong with what New York... Who cares if exactly. this, this thing is destroyed? Because yeah. I don't believe in God, yeah. so kill it. Yeah. That's where we are as That's a nation. Where we're at. And so, yes, yeah. and we so, need to repent as a country. We need to repent. The church needs to repent. That we, you can't expect a non-believer to repent. The church needs to repent of her apathy. Well, let's not forget this, too. And then the United States Senate would not even sign on to a resolution by uh, Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska to say, look, once a child is born, they have the same rights as any other child, whether it's a, a child of a botched abortion or not. And what happened, Jack? They couldn't get 60 votes for that. Yeah. Where have we come right. on to as a country? I mean, in such a short period of time, you can't make this stuff up. So anyway, that's one of the main stories that's been on my heart. It's, it's so heartbreaking because we see our country going so left, so south, so soon. All right, uh, so many things to deal with. Uh, boy, April 7th, they're coming very soon. You've got two parties now, and it's the same thing happening in Israel that's been happened here. All the media is left-wing liberal. When I look at the site, don't you read every story? It's anti-Netanyahu this, oh, yeah. anti-Netanyahu that, all of that. And this new center-left coalition is your new progressive group, your new green group, as it were. The top person on the charts, top female that this blue and white group has is a former television broadcaster. She was asked about the great wealth that's out in the Mediterranean Sea, you know, the natural gas fields. What to do with that, the billions of dollars. You know what she said? Let's not do anything. Let's just leave it there. Let's get uh, solar power. Let's get, you know, wind power. Let's do that. Well, how about even selling it? No, no, let's just leave it there. And so hear it now. Okay, since we met last, Israel 
eighth most powerful country yeah. in the world, the fifth highest in the world with respect to technology, the tenth healthiest country in the world, and the eighth country in the world with respect to selling arms to other countries. They have been successful in 70 years, Jack. They've done all this, and yet they're about to, they could, they may throw it all away in an election coming April 9th. The, um, the region is so de uh, destabilized, of course, you know that, with what's happening in the, uh, the, the constant uh, transport and movement of weaponry uh, from Iran, Russian military goods and Iran, or, or Iranian goods coming into Syria, and it's escalating. I know a couple months ago we stood here and said the same thing before. Now it's, now it's more. There's actually, uh, Israel has satellite imagery now of, of weapons being transported uh, into Syria from Iran. And one of the political attacks is now to bring or to dethrone, I guess, Netanyahu, get somebody else in there who is, is uh, favorable toward appeasement. Church, appeasement feels good for a moment. Uh, but the only reason why, of course, God's protecting Israel, but it's just interesting that Netanyahu is coming up for this, uh, at this election cycle and Israel is at a very dangerous point right now because there are those within the government of Israel that would be fine handing Israel over. Strange, you wouldn't yeah. think so. But, oh no, let's just, let it, let's just compromise, get him out, and let's just sing Kumbaya while the enemies around Israel are chanting death to Israel, we're going to destroy Israel, we're going to kill every Jew. And it's remarkable. It's, it's just absolutely remarkable. But the, the news is full of it. And... We mentioned this not too long ago, but are we possibly, and you saw that headline, are we possibly on the brink? Are we already actually into the opening throes of a third world war? Yeah. Outside of Ezekiel, what if it's a world war? Yeah. It's possible, people, but uh, not, not to shake you up, but to, to get you to understand that God's in control. Yeah, very possible. You know, what, what's happening here? This is so, uh, Benny, Benny Gantz, who is the head of this blue and white party, is an ex-general. Mm -hmm. Israel's had three ex-generals ruling, Rabin, Sharom, and Ehud Barak. And all of them were failures. All of their administrations were failures. Why try it again? Here you've got another ex-general. Mm -hmm. you know, he hasn't been a politician at all. None. He's going to learn on the job. And he is an appeaser, too, by the way. The blue and whites are appeasers. They're the center left. They're left wing. Let's face the progressives there. So for some reason, it seems like Israel wants to commit national suicide. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, but the elections like neck and neck. You know, they have a parliamentary system, 120 seats. You have to get um, 61 to form a government. Not one uh, party will get them all. Uh, you have to put a coalition together. It looks like now it's going to be neck and neck, like 61 to 59. And so pray, please, because the same thing's happening in Israel that's happening here in our country. For some reason, they don't like the leader that's there that's leading Israel into prosperity. Eighth most powerful country in the world. Fifth in technology. Tenth in health. Eighth with respect to selling you know, arms to other countries. In 70 years, 70 years ago, when they first formed the modern state of Israel, they were using World War I weapons. That's how they won the War of Independence. This is a miracle. Israel's, you know, well, everything about it's a miracle, but it's interesting to, to see. So Israel is one of these main stories we'll have to keep our eye on. And uh, there's so much going on there. With respect, too, to the Temple Mount in Israel. Can we segue into that now? Yes, please. All right. What's been going on... Um, very interesting. On the Temple Mount, I've been watching it. The Golden Gate, the Eastern Gate, is the gate that was closed in 1187 by Shulaman the Magnificent. That's in the walls now of, of modern-day Jerusalem. You see the, you know, from the Mount of All, you can see the Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate there. All right. Uh, recently, well, there's a, inside the Temple Mount, there is a little area. You walk down to it, and there's a room there, a mosque, as it were, there, a room. It's been closed since 2003. A couple weeks ago, Muslims said, no, no, we're going to open it up again. We're gonna, we're, what we're going to do, we're going to build another mosque here. What we're going to do, we're going we're to just place ourselves here once and for all for good. And, of course, the Israelis said, no, 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 you're not going to do this again because the status quo says, which was uh, they've all signed on to, you don't build any more mosques. You don't 
don't do anything on the Temple Mount. And so what did we have? We had a riot yesterday on the Temple Mount. Molotov cocktail thrown by this young man, injured an Israeli policewoman there on the Mount, rioting there. Mahmoud Abbas, as usual, started lying about it, saying, you know, the Israelis are trying to take over the Mount to build a synagogue on the Mount or to divide it between the, the, the uh, Israelis and the Muslims there. And so you've got that as the centerpiece. Now, why is this important? Why this is important is because the Temple Mount is ground zero, the epicenter. Israel is God's timepiece, his clock. The nation is the hour hand. City of Jerusalem is the minute hand, but the Temple Mount is the second hand because the Bible says on that mountain someday a third temple will be built. And when that temple is, be, is built, sometime after it's built, the sacrifices that are there will stop. And when they're stopped by this coming man of sin, according to Daniel 9, 27 and 12, 11, you count 1,290 days or three and a half years, and the second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth takes place. That's why this is the most important spot on the face of the earth. Jesus said, you know, this begins the great tribulation, Matthew 24, 21. He said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, and that's Israel in this context, those days are shortened. So we always keep our eye on Israel, Jerusalem, but in particular the Temple Mount. And again, it's fomenting the unrest that's there. And so you've got that going on because many people think that they're doing this purposely leading up to the election to kind of make Netanyahu look weak. He's not, you know, Mr. Security as that, as we see both in Gaza on the south and on the north, like Jack mentioned, in both Syria and Lebanon. So it's a very dicey time for the nation of Israel. What's going to happen? Only literally God knows. But what we're seeing here is setting the stage, like he mentioned earlier, with the Putin thing and Netanyahu, with what's going on in Syria. There's so much going on that literally the... the pieces are all falling into place. Just, you know, it's God's timing when it's all going to happen, Jack, but we see it happening over and over again here that uh, you can't make this stuff up. It's just going on one day after another. Now, I'm going to run through some headlines, and then Don, can you, I'm just like a, sure. this is a lightning round, and this is kind of like, this is a, a, a little bit of a, a genre just in this. Okay, sure. So, uh, world news. Russia prepares for war with NATO and strikes against Western Europe report reveals that Russia has been working military models out in their computer systems for their Navy, for their Air Force right. and troops. Um, that's on the news. This is all you want me to comment on that one? You first? can. Okay, yeah, they have a hypersonic rocket. Yes. You know about that. They're going to Fastest thing in the air in the world. You know, you know how long it could take to get to the U.S. soil? Five minutes. There's Five. never been anything like this Hypers ever created. We got, we got busted. We're, we have right now, we have egg on our face because we discovered that they had it. And you, there is no, in fact, that same, that same article said that there is no U.S. or no, Chinese uh, system that could stop this Russian. I, I hesitate calling it a missile. It's yeah, just, it's, it, it yeah. defies physics. Exactly, yeah. Uh, World War III rehearsal. Russia releases chilling nuclear hit list, including yep. a Trump retreat. Yeah, Camp David is four of the places on the East Coast and one in California. Camp McCullen David. Air, yeah, McCullen Air Force Base, but all the, the other four are then uh, the East Coast. That's right. But once they're us. That's right. Again, same. this is uh, Fox News. Uh, War Games shows U.S. forces being crushed by joint Russian-Chinese attack on the United States. Yep. These are not, these, this is not hokey strange news. This is, these are NBC, this is Fox, this is uh, world news. Um, the, the strange thing is that they're running these models. What's interesting is China and Russia know how to keep secrets. Why are they leaking this stuff? Because, you know, it's getting, what, what could be the possibility or the results of it? There's just a lot of, what would the Bible call this? Anybody? Yes, wars, Jesus said in the last days there'll be wars and, and rumors, rumors of, of, war. <laughs> of wars. U.S. Navy plans to send, this is a big deal, send surface fleets uh, throughout the Atlantic, changing U.S. policy, the, the United States Navy will start patrolling uh, the Arctic. Anybody want to know why? Don knows why. Anybody want to know why we need now to patrol the Arctic now? Because Russia has declared the Arctic belongs to them. Yes. Russia's saying it's theirs now. So we've got to make adjustments to our policy. Why is Russia doing this? 
What's the deal? What's, for those of us who are old enough, we grew up with hiding underneath the desk mm -hmm. in school because the Soviet Union was attacking. Why? Because they had global dominance on the mine. Vladimir Putin wants to restore Russia to its former glory of global pursuit. I think those 50% should be subject to socialism standards of living. Yeah, I'd have bust him to Venezuela. No, around me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, really. Yeah, yeah. If, I was a, if I was a university professor or a high school teacher, yeah. that's what I'd do. I'd say, how many of you are for, for socialism? Then they're going to raise their hands. 50% is them going to raise their hands. Then I would say, we're going to adopt the fruit of socialism for the next 30 days in this classroom. Yeah. We're going to adopt what a socialist classroom is like, and we're going to do it. I'd do it. I'd give it to them. I'd have them get the food rations. The, the clothing, the whole thing. Bring their candles with them, too. I right? would do it. Yeah. Russian military chief outlines aggressive anti-U.S. war strategy. Russia, again, uh, discussing Russian large-scale military buildup and models uh, against the United States in war games. So that's, that's the same genre. Yeah, you know, this is interesting. It's all going on. And we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but we do know this. The United States is not in Bible prophecy. We are not a player. We can fill in the blank as to why we are not, but it's stories like these and worrisome things that are going on. Uh, not only what's happening with Russia and China, let's not forget little rocket man down in North Korea. It seems he and the Iranians are making, working hammer and tong fastly to create nuclear weapons still, even with all that's going mm -hmm. on. And so hopefully that won't be the, the end of the story. We hope that what's happening, the United States isn't a player because there's such a revival here. There's no one left when the rapture comes, right? Oh, Jack, I wish. We, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. I wish. Wouldn't that be that wonderful? That would be great. But that would be great. And optimistic for sure. We would love that to happen. Wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be fabulous. What if it doesn't? Well, then, yeah. What if it doesn't where the United States is a problem to the globalists? Big time. Nationalism. Now, people theoretically are going to say, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm against nationalism. A lot of people are saying, 50% yep. are saying this. Um, first of all, God put nationalism in your heart. Okay. He says that in the book of Daniel. Well, there should be no borders. Well, you're going up against the God of the Bible then. God's, God says he's established all the borders of the nations that exist. And he's put people within the habitations thereof. So when we talk about this movement towards uh, socialism or globalism, we have to understand something, that we are really pushing actually toward what the Bible, what Jesus talked about and the Old Testament prophets talked about in the last days of lawlessness. We're heading towards lawlessness. Things don't matter. Things that are, things that are needed to sustain or to have a normal culture no longer matter to the theorist. If you live in a theory, if your life is limited to a classroom, then you don't have to deal with reality. So you can dream. You can dream. And if you can dream, then you can do these things and we can have this one world and we can hug and all this kind of stuff. But notice that you can't do that without lawlessness. Lawlessness is sweeping the world right now. So keep your eyes on borders among nations and that, that debate and uh, these, this, this rise of... Uh, what is the word? So uh, tolerance, r rise of humanism, uh, as long as those who do not agree with the humanism, those people have to be censored. But notice that there's an embracing of anything goes. Totally. Anything goes. And we're watching right now, friends. We're watching right now in California. We are watching right now in San Bernardino County, Orange County, LA County. Uh, since recent decisions have been made, for example, regarding the, the sex education. In the last several months, the explosion of sexual activity being reported in our counties that we reside in, in schools with kids as young as first grade, who are now being shown the data that I wanted to show you, but. I didn't, but you could go look. Remember the last year? And what, too graphic. Now they're getting it, you know, in first grade. And it's happening in the bathrooms at the schools now in our counties. 
And pe- parents are asking, how did this happen? What? How did this happen? While you were sleeping. Yeah. And we have, it's, it's just the beginning. What are we talking about? Lawlessness. Again, lawlessness. But um, I'm off target. I'm off target. Syria is ready for war you with Israel. You want me Israel. to follow up on for a second? Yeah. I'd like one second on the, go, uh, on the globalism thing that you're on to that. Let's not forget that started at Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel when God said spread out. No, we're all going to go in one place. Then Genesis 10 tells us where the people went to various parts of the world. And as Jack said, God gave specific borders to nations. And by rejecting borders, they're rejecting God gave a promised land with a series of specific borders to a nation, the nation of Israel. So by rejecting borders, what are you rejecting? A holy land for God's people. And so that's what's going on. And as Jack mentioned, at the time of the end, when a global is no, no, no borders out. That's what they're pushing. They're trying, that's what the EU is trying to push uh, England to get back, the Britain to get back into the European Union so we can control you, Jack. Daniel 2.42 says, in the last days, this coalition will be like iron mixed with clay. Iron and clay don't adhere because what you have, you have the government doing something, but the people don't want it. They want to be free, but you don't have freedom, do you? You have total control, and that's what happens in globalism, socialism, ergo Marxism, too. Mm. So. And if you have that, if you have that socialism, Marxism model, in that model, there's no room for God. None. How convenient is that for our culture today? The, you know, it's very possible that the greatest threat to Christian freedom or religious freedom in America, and it's just fine with the, with the young generation, is let's, let's have socialism because we don't like religion anyway. So let's take the big G out of God and we'll, we'll take that big G and we'll put it on government. And that will become our God. It will feed us. It will take care of us from cradle to grave. We don't need God. We have government. And let's go for that. And that's, that's what you see happening. And, and you see, well, that's kind of extreme. Well, talk to your, talk to your college kid at school and ask, ask them what they're learning in math class instead of math. They're learning about these things. But again, you said it exactly right. I've not thought about that before, that the ultimate borders is the land promised to Abraham. Exactly. And God specified clearly from this point to that point, over there to this to that, are your borders, Mm -hmm. Israel. And no borders, no holy land, no God, right? That's what they're trying to get out. And by the way, uh, one more Christian, one less Chinese, China. There's a story today, official vows to get rid of Western influences, meaning Protestant Christianity in China. So that's where the world's going, Jack. You know, it's trying. In this country, all around the world, to get rid of anything that has anything to do with God, uh, Judeo-Christian ethic, and the two groups that are being persecuted today, we get a hold of the anti-Semitism thing, are the Christians and the Jews. That's what the Bible says in the last days. Christians and Jews will be the two groups being persecuted. But you ever think of it this way? What does it assume? In the last days, there'll still be Jews exist. There'll still be Christians that exist. <laughs> I mean, that's, that prediction, it wasn't a slam dunk at the time for either people group, and they will be persecuted. Who are the two people groups in the world persecuted now? Christians and Jews. Why? Because we have an ethic. We have a, a holy book, a sacred book. They've got to get rid of that. The progressives do, not only in this country, China, Western Europe, too, and, and wherever else we yeah. want to go. Don, what can you say about uh, right now uh, there is a U.S. Uh, contingency of uh, senators and congressmen? Yesterday they are at the Golan Heights. Yeah. Um, making some pretty tremendous statements. Yes. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I'd love to. Actually, it was Lindsey Graham, Graham. Gramnesty that did this. He, uh, he uh, was there at the Golan Heights, and he said the U.S. has to recognize the Golan Heights as sovereign Israel territory. And today it was interesting. A statement was made. In fact, the Palestinians have come out and said, wait, what are you doing this? It sounded like the U.S. was recognizing the Golan Heights as sovereign Israeli territory. Let's understand what happened. In 1967, the Six-Day War, the Golan Heights, the city of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, the, the, the Mount of Olives, and the Golan Heights were liberated by the Israelis in a war with Syria. It became Israeli territory. It's been that way since 1967. In 73, with the Yom Kippur War, uh, they, actually the, the Syrian army came down from the Golan Heights and over, actually overlooked the Sea of Galilee. And one of the stories our, uh, one of our guides tells us how miraculously God 
intervene there in this Golan Heights area. And as we're going to talk about, a very rich area in many ways. It's, you know, this is the high country. It's the high ground you want to have. Anyway, this tank commander, he comes down, no interference whatsoever on the Yom Kippur. And they thought, it's got to be an ambush. So what does he do? He turns his tank around, drives four and a half hours all the way to Damascus, tells his troops to stop, goes in and talks to Assad, says, sir, I think it's an ambush. Nothing happened on our way down. Well, they shot the guy dead right there and tried to get the word, keep going forward. By that time, the Israelis had moved and and moved back into a defensive position because on Yom Kippur in 1973, there was no Apple, there was no, uh, you know, internet. Everybody had radios, but on the Day of Atonement, you turn your radio off, your TV off, because it's the one day to fast. Miraculously, God saved the people then. But the Golan Heights, not only a strategic area, there's the possibility, Jack, of a tremendous oil reserve there too, as you know. Yep. The normal size, I'm told, of an oil reserve is something like 35 meters. This one could be as deep as 350 meters, 10 times the usual, billions of dollars of oil. And this disputed territory, the Golan Heights, which Syria claims, the United Nations says it belongs to Syria, okay? Uh, Russia is going to invade someday, Jack, to take a spoil, right? That's right. Ezekiel chapter 38 says, um, it's rather interesting too, when the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, with the coalition of today, which are all Muslim nations who have vowed the destruction of Israel, so here, here you've got a 20... 600-year-old prophecy saying that in the last days that the, the leader of the ancient peoples or, nation, or, or people group of, that's north of Israel, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, they're going to have these other nations, and it says that, they, that you will be a guard for them. In the old King James, I think it's the old King James that says guard and the word in the Hebrew is a supplier, a provider for them. You'll be a provider for them. You'll be a supplier to them. So you need to check that out on your own. Ezekiel chapter 38. Whoever Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, its leader is, goes by the title of Gog, G-O-G. And he's going to be the provider to nations that are mentioned. And those nations mentioned are in play right now in the news, vowing to destroy Israel right now. But you say, well, what's, does Russia want to destroy Israel? I don't think Russia wants to destroy Israel. I think Russia needs what Israel has. For one thing, Russia needs the Mediterranean. Yes. The other thing is, already it's very much spoken of, and I think it's going to increase, as Don just mentioned. Keep your eye on the news. Israel is going to very soon, if not already, will be a dominant uh, super power of that region right now. The small, such a small country, yet economically, you said it in your yeah. opening, economically, militarily. <laughs> Lindsey Graham said yesterday that the United States has no idea the amount of intelligence and engineering that Israel supplies to the United States? That makes China upset. That upsets Russia. That upsets a lot of countries. We need Israel. The world needs Israel. I had a Muslim whose family live in Gaza tell me that since Israel pulled out of Gaza and left, his family's life has gone down the tubes because medical's gone, Food's gone, water's gone, policing is gone. You don't hear that in the news. But the, the, the point is this, that Israel is going to soon become a superpower in the region. And the Bible says that Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal in the lands of Libya, think of it, Turkey, and it gives the list of them, Persia will come against Israel to take the booty, the spoils, the rewards. I don't think they care about the Jew. They want the goods. And Israel's sitting on Leviathan, which is considered the largest natural gas reserve, yep. and oil. Watch their oil discoveries increase. They're already huge. It's increasing. Amazing. What else? Well, by the way, too, what I didn't mention, you know, Israel's soon going to be the fourth nation 
that puts a rocket ship on the moon. Oh, yeah. China, Russia, and the U.S. With already? a Bible. Yes. Did you know that? Yes, with a Bible. Netanyahu ordered a Bible to be on that lunar Isn't that great? module. Isn't I mean, great? I mean, think about it, Jack. Here they've only been in existence as a modern state for 70 years. They started out in total poverty in 70 years. Look where they become miraculous, as the, Ezekiel 37, 38 says. You know, and that's why, in thir uh, you know, that's why they're going to want to come and take a spoil because Israel has something these nations want and something they need. That's right. Switching gears. European Union shock. How a staggering 86% of European Union citizens, so this is the USE, the United States of Europe, quote, do not feel very attached to Brussels. Discontent with the EU has been growing in many member states as according to a 2018 poll, a staggering 86% of its citizens do not feel that Brussels is their capital. The European Union has no leader. <laughs> but the Bible talks about a man coming out of what we've traced simply, clearly, just take the time, of what is the ancient Roman Empire. A man will arise out of a conglomerate of 10 leaders. The Bible tells us there'll be an 11th guy, number 11. He's not going to be very significant. The Bible tells you that he is a stout fellow who speaks uh, proud or arrogant words. He's going to be an orator. And the Bible says that he, he the 11th, will arise among the 10. And he'll put all, all of them down, but was it three or four of them? Was it three? And he will use them until the right time. And then he will throw them off and seize power. Um, it, interesting, the Bible tells us that he will also be the, the, uh, the one who, what, issues the permit, as it were, to yeah. rebuild the temple? Probably, yeah. Probably. Most, most likely, second yeah. Text, yeah, second text. Yeah, he'd be the, the man of peace, as it were. It's interesting, too, you mentioned that 86% yeah. don't like it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 41, 42, it's iron mixed with clay. They don't adhere because the people don't want that. It's going to be forced on them. This society, this socialist, globalist society just doesn't work. People like their own borders, their own tradition, their own history, their own mores, their own laws. That's all gone by the wayside. We're one big conglomeration with no borders. There was a, you know, a migrant act passed in the 11th or 12th of December last year, which basically says migrancy is a right. You can go to any country in the world you want to and live there. No one can tell you not to. And about 136 countries signed on to that. Now, it's not non-binding, but it's a resolution that they made saying literally anybody can go anywhere in the world they want to and nobody can tell them no, no matter who they are, whether they're a criminal or whoever they might be, because we're free to roam anywhere because we have no borders anymore anymore, which is one big happy world, right? But trouble is, Jack, nobody's happy, are they? Well, the removing of borders, uh, on March 25th, you guys, on March 25th, uh, the French National Assembly has approved yep. the creation of a new Franco-German assembly that would unite the two countries into one parliament. Yeah. Did you hear that? What does that tell you? They're admitting that the European Union's not working. So they're going to create their own little unity off to the side. They're struggling. They, want their, own, struggling. they want their own army, too. That's right. Yeah. Their own army, their own... Um, yeah, they want to get out of NATO and do their own thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we want to get to questions, though. Okay, sure, we got to go. Yeah, so, sure. Um, this is really the same. Oh, can we, before we do that, sure. this is insane. Did you guys see this? Oh. I got, I, you got to get set up for this. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, those of you who know the book of Revelation, do you remember there's a trinity, there's a demonic trinity, remember? Mm -hmm. There's the Antichrist, right? The guy that we've been talking about. Right. There's the false prophet, and there's a third thing. There's a, tri there's a trinity. Well, I mean, obviously, the third thing is Satan himself, but there's an image. Image. Remember, the Bible says that in the last days, there's going to be an image that has been given power by humans, by us, for it to both speak and it is able to discern, Revelation 13, it's able to discern who has got the identifying mark of the global unified government of the world. 
and that global unified government of the world has a prefix, and the Bible tells you what the number of, of that prefix is. Anybody know the number? Yeah. 666. All in the Bible. So check this out. In Buddhism, the, the Buddhists have created a manifestation of the Buddha, Buddhist deity to be able to preach in Japanese at a temple, okay? And it is, there you go, good job, guys. It is a god, it is a god, it's artificial intelligence, and it's able to preach in a temple in the ancient city of Kyoto. It's man-made, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, teaching the teachings of Buddha. You say, that's insane. Of course it is to you. The world, this is just right up the, the alley of the imagination and an app. Yep. How cool to worship by an app. Yeah, yeah. Ro- robot God. I had a story today I did on breaking news on his channel. You'll love this one, Jack. A U.S. general on the AI, the artificial ethical concerns. Well, the military were actually light years away from Skynet. Remember Skynet? Yeah, I'll be back, right? Yeah, yeah. Skynet, Rise of the Machines, 1997, according to the first Terminator movie, where the machines took over because they received so much intelligence, they started thinking on their own and took over. Well, stage is being set for this. And like what Jack said, the stage is set for this image. But this will be a supernatural work here when we get this false uh-huh. prophet and the uh, final antichrist image. It won't be able to be explained in any natural right. way. And it's going to be different Very than good. anything else. So it's going to be a little bit distinct. But the world's getting set up for this. It's, it's amazing. Um, Don, the book of Corinth, Paul tells the Corinthians that when they bow down to uh, idols or statues, they're bowing down to demons. Right. He just said something very important with the way technology is going. And it must be pretty bad for Elon Musk to say, we are definitely going down the wrong road on this. Yep. Is, AI is not a good way to go, yep. Elon Musk said. <laughs> Listen to this. I believe that this, and I just, this is what I believe. This is just off my head. But these images that are being created, mm-hmm. I think at some point in time, like Paul warned about in Corinthians, these, these images, these idols, these robots, they're going to be demon-possessed somehow. Because Paul said in, to the Corinthians that statues can be demon-possessed. So, uh, guys, the slide that says people in this 400-year-old temple worship robot goddess, these guys are bowing down to this thing, and they're going to be bowing down. And listen to this. People visiting Japan's 400-year-old, I can't say the word, temple, will soon be worshiping a new robot deity. The administrators of the Kyoto-based temple have unveiled a robotic avatar, the Buddhist goddess of mercy, as a way to keep the younger generation connected to Buddhism. I almost want to add, and coming to a church near you. Exactly, exactly. We got to do it, whatever we can to keep young people. Notice it gives a 25 minute long sermon also. Interesting. That's longer than some sermons. It is, yeah, I know. Isn't that amazing? Don't you think that's absolutely crazy? Yeah. I think it's crazy. I thought you guys would be wowed by that. But anyway. Yeah, wow. Uh, the world's first genderless AI voice. Researchers launch neutral sounding Q. That's neither male nor female to fight bias and smart assistance. Okay. Um, Don, I think that's, this is just more AI stuff. Sure. Um, you guys want to go to, do you guys have questions? Want to do some questions? Okay, so... Pastor Roy, Pastor David, uh, we'll have microphones. We and you don't have to br- you don't have to bring up a topic that's uh-huh. been mentioned. You can you can bring up. No, I mean we'd like you to to have it be, if at all, prophecy based question. And if you're going to ask a question, can you get in line now so we can prepare time wise? Come on, you can do it. Uh, Yes, Don, Uh, I'd like to ask a somewhat off-topic question. In 1945, when the Russian army was overrunning Berlin and Hitler realized everything was lost, his valet asked him, he said, for whom will we fight now? And Hitler said, for the coming man. And I just wondered if that was a satanic reference. Uh, Yeah, good question. You know, uh, very interesting. Um, 
Adolf Hitler uh, was the one who nobody thought could arise after Germany lost the First World War. Uh, the military was taken away, but Hitler, you can make a great case, not only he, but the whole Third Reich, the whole upper echelon were all demon-possessed. Werner von Braun, the famous rocketry expert, talked about after the Second World War, he would discuss technical things of rocketry with Hitler, and Hitler understood it. He had like a second grade education, that's all he did. And so, uh, whether this is a prophecy, you know, from, you know, from the pit or something like that, well, again, Hitler was raised a Catholic too, remember? And so, uh, in fact, he claimed to be a Christian on certain times when he went in his anti-Semitic tirades against the Jews. So who knows what he meant? But the point is, whether Hitler said it or not, it's going to happen. This man of sin is coming. First John 2.18 says there's many antichrists. Every generation has an antichrist. There's always someone waiting in the wings. Uh, one thing when I wrote my book on the subject, The Final Antichrist, I d never realized this until someone pointed it out. I read it in an old Moody Bible Institute book from the 60s, and it said this, you know, every generation has to has a, have an antichrist, someone waiting in the wings to be that final man of sin because only God knows who he is. Satan doesn't know who he is. He didn't know the future. He didn't know when God's going to end his program. So there's always got to be somebody ready. And people thought Hitler was, Mussolini at the end of the Second World War. Like Jack said earlier, it's going to be someone that comes out of obscurity, someone you least expect from this European power in the last days. But uh, uh, again, I wouldn't give much credence to Hitler's prophecies, but it's, it's scriptural. Yeah, this man is coming. Question? Yeah. It's okay. He's, I don't think he's... Is he ready? We ready? Yeah. Yeah. Being, uh, f the fact being that the church is not going to be here for the tribulation or, or for where all this happens, well, why, uh, why even be concerned if we're not even going to be here for the, for the events when uh, the Antichrist shows up or, or uh, we're, we're, the church is out? Great. The time. So why should we yeah. be Excellent concerned question. about anything? So awesome. If we're not here, who cares? Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Number one, Old Testament's... Old Testament says that the sons of Ishakar discerned the, the times and the seasons that Israel were, was in, and they knew what Israel should do. Number two, Paul told the body of believers in Acts chapter 20 that he did not refrain from them. He did not hold back from them the entire or full counsel of God. Think about that. That's all of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. He taught to them all of it. Thirdly, for me, is the most important, that we can use future events that we will have no part of as evangelistic tools for people today. It's a great way to encourage people. Somebody might say to you, I don't believe in God. I don't want, you know, you're telling me about this thing and about that thing. Hey, listen, the same God that made all those ancient prophecies that were fulfilled is the same God that's going to keep his promises up to the moment the church goes up and he's going to keep on promise his promises for the tribulation period and all of that, because ultimately the best thing of, of all is this, is that, remember, we get to come back with Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation yeah, yeah, period. Yeah. <clears throat> That's awesome. Yeah, no, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because we do... Oh, I'm sorry. We, just to make sure there's nothing to fear because no. if we're right with Jesus, we have uh, absolutely nothing to fear. So Amen. All this... Uh, the, what the world should be concerned about, people that don't have Jesus. Oh, no, we're, we get, be, uh, we're, that's why we're smiling. Amen. We're not going to uh, be here. We're, uh, yeah. yeah. No. We're, we're with the Lord. You know what I mean? We, we, Amen. No, no. I'm, I'm hoping someone's watching like right now and hearing that like, really, the Bible's that accurate? Well, maybe I need Jesus too. Yeah. You know? That, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah I, wanna, uh, I love your heart, brother. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, great. I want to I piggyback on what Jack said. We use this for evangelism. It's a means to an end to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because the God of the Bible knows the end from the beginning. He claims to know things that haven't happened yet. And here we are sitting looking at events that are going to take place in the future, mm -hmm. according to Ezekiel 2,600 years ago, and the stage is set for that right now. How in the world could anybody know this sort of thing? The fact that the Jews would still exist in the last days, the fact that they would come back to their ancient homeland, the yeah. fact they'd come back to a land that's been decimated by war, the fact they'd been away for a long time, the fact they'd come back in large numbers, the fact that they would create great wealth to the place other nations want to take something from this little tiny country the size of New Jersey where you can't even write the name in the landmass. You have to write it out in the Mediterranean Sea in a map. It's so small. And yet they will attack that five million square kilometers of, of territory of these nations against this one little nation, Israel, because Israel has this wealth. And here we see today 
exactly every single thing in place that the Bible predicted and is there. If, yeah. Don, what if right now there's, what if there's a Jew watching right now somewhere here in the world and they're watching and they're listening to this and it leads them yeah. to salvation? Exactly. And I love, the, I love this question because you guys, the Old Testament prophets that spoke, for that matter, Peter and Paul, the things that they spoke about the future, they didn't get to see the fulfillment of no. those things. They spoke into the future as they were moved by the Spirit. We get to take the word of God that they authored through the Holy Spirit and look into the future, all to build your confidence in the Bible. Uh, so yep. it's well, let me get one more point on this. Daniel and Daniel 12, 4. When he heard this, he said, I heard, but I didn't understand. <laughs> and what did the angels say? Go your way, go. Daniel. Seal up the book until the time of the end. Many one go to and fro, but at the time of the end, knowledge will increase. Daniel 12, 10 says, at the time of the end, the wise will understand, the wicked will never understand. So we know what's going on. That's why we're smiling. We know how it's all going to turn out. We're going to win. And so that's why we teach this subject, because even though the world's going desperately in a very difficult a season soon, we know what's going to eventually happen. The God of, of the universe is going to come back and set up his kingdom on the planet. So that's why we do this, that's to put awesome. it in perspective of all things. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. <clears throat> Gentlemen, good evening. Hi. Uh, just a little clarification, kind of your thoughts about some development or uh, what may come about to make this happen. One verse, Ezekiel 38, 11, about them not just uh, dwelling securely, but peacefully with no walls, no, board, you know, no uh, gates, no bars. Yep. How That's does it look a, that way now? A great question. I'll mention it. Don can finish it off. If you look at the word uh, in Ezekiel 38, 11, it's not only there, by the way, it's, an, it's referenced also in other places. Uh, he asked the question, but Israel's got to be living safe and securely. It doesn't look like that now. Um, the, the word in the Hebrew there is an assumed peace. They believe that they're safe. It's, it's a deceived peace. They think they're safe. They're not safe. They think they're living in peace while the enemy's sharpening their sword. It's a little bit of delusion. So that's a great question, and the reality of what's going on in the world around Israel proves uh, how that delusion in the, in, the, in the Jewish mind is, we're good, well, everything's fine, we'll, we're strong, you mentioned it, we got a great economy, we got the greatest air force, we, we can do it. They, dwell, they believe they dwell safely today. Yeah, it was the same thing that I mentioned earlier in Yom Kippur. Um, the generals knew that there was going to be an attack, but they didn't think it was going to be on the Day of Atonement. So they told the people, relax, our intelligence said it's not going to happen now. So they turn off all the radios, all the TV, they, and then it happened that day. They thought they were safe. Now think about it this way, and this is why this is so amazing. You can't make this stuff up. A few years ago, one of the questions we had is how in the world could they be attacked not seeing it coming? Well, we thank the Islamic State for that because at one time a few years ago they controlled one-third of Syria, one-third of Iraq to get them out of there, coalitions of different groups amongst, you know, the Americans finally came in at the end under uh, President Trump, but the Iranians, uh, the Russians, the Turks and that have rid, uh, rid the Islamic State, ISIS, of that particular area. For nation building now, who is coming? There is a land bridge all the way from Tehran through Iraq, through Syria, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea with Iranian soldiers, Iranian conscripts, and that to rebuild the country of Syria, which has been a civil war since 2011. They're going to be filling the country with these people. They're going to be there as part of the landscape, and they're going to be seen as being there all the time. So if they maneuver here, maneuver there, okay, we've seen this before, but one day they're going to turn south and they're going to attack Israel. But see, they're not coming thousands of miles or hundreds of miles. They're 15 miles from the Israeli border right now. And there's actually Syrian troops, uh, excuse me, uh, Iranian troops. You've got Hezbollah, you've got Shiite militia on the Syrian border dressed as Syrian soldiers right now. And so that uh, fills, Jack, something we, you know, fulfills something we were wondering for years. How in the world could they be surprised? Well, they're not coming from a long distance because of satellite I've... technology. You'd see them massing, right? You don't have to now. They're right there. I've always, just exactly what you said, we always thought that there would be this invasion somehow and there's, you know, it would take a, yeah. an assemblage of power. And now they're, now they're miles away. They're right there. And we just never saw that one coming. Nope, Here's the point. The Bible said that that they would come out of the uttermost parts of the north. The old King James, Ezekiel, that Israel's enemy would come from the uttermost parts of the north, which is the furthest point north. From what? What's the, what's, according to the Bible, what's the center 
of the map of the world. If you were to unfold the map, of course, you know, we have Washington, D.C. as the center of the world, America. Well, that's because it's an American map. Russia has Russia in the middle. God has Jerusalem in the middle, right? It's true. And if you go directly north, th magnetic or true north, you're going to go through two towns, two cities, magnetic or true, from Jerusalem. One puts you through Moscow, and the other one puts you through Mur Murmansk, the political capital of Russia and the military capital of Russia. It's rather amazing. God says, out of the uttermost parts of the north, this one will come and attack you. But now, when they said come, he didn't say they're going to come from thousands of miles in an hour. Mm -hmm. Now they're across the street. Yep. It's absolutely amazing. You know, an interesting point of trivia now. Why is it called the Middle East? Because the Brits thought they were the center of the world. And, and from Britain, Israel in the, middle, in the Middle East compared to their map of the world. Because they thought their new no, the Japanese that's thought they were, again, the center. Everybody thinks they're the center of the world in that. But that's why we got the name Middle East. Because that was, thankfully, the, the, the yeah. Brits gave it that. Because since we're the center of the world, you know, hail Britannia. And so that's Middle East yep. uh, from, uh, from Great Britain. London used to be considered the capital of the world. Exactly, yeah. If you go to Sacramento, Gavin Newsom's office is the middle of the map of yeah. the entire universe. I'm kidding. Yeah. I, had to, I just had to <laughs> say that. Over here. Um, I understand that Damascus is going to be destroyed in, in prophecy. The timing of it is, um, is not precise, whether it's before or after the rapture. My question is, um, with, we know that there's going to be additional persecution of Christians and Jews as time gets closer. Do you think that could be a triggering point? And perhaps it is before the rapture, because that would elevate you're, the You're talking about Isaiah 17? Yeah, yeah. Damascus. I, me personally, I get up in the morning and I turn on the news for about 30, 30 to 60 seconds. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I turn on the news. If something big has happened in the world, big, I'm talking big, it's going to be on the news. And you'll know within 60 seconds. I, ex I expect every day I wake up, I expect to hear some catastrophe coming out of Damascus. That's where I believe Isaiah 17 could happen any moment now. And I think now's the time. There's no Christians there anymore. And then the persecution would increase because they're going to blame it on the Christians or the Jews, no matter who well, does Well, you know it. the Jews are <laughs> going to get blamed for Isaiah yeah. 17. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, they're probably blaming the Jews right now for Facebook being down. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just a, it's, it, history repeats itself. Uh, the Jew was, was blamed for Europe's woes in, in World War II era. So, I mean, it's just, yeah. yeah. Isaiah 17, man, I think any day. Now, it doesn't have to be, but I look for it every day, second to the rapture. Thank you. So, as a young attendee of this church, uh, I want to say that I absolutely love talks like this, and prophecy and prophecy fulfillment are probably one of the main reasons that I'm a believer. So my question for you guys is in regards to the future of genetic modification. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, many people probably haven't heard that the second person ever in the world was recently cured of HIV AIDS inside the womb. Uh, this was out of China. And I'm wondering what, uh, if there's anything pertaining to that towards prophecy or what, you, uh, what your thoughts are on the future and maybe the dangers of this kind of technology. Yeah, let me take that one. First of all, we don't know if they're cured yet. That was genetic modification because uh, there was a man in China that experimented on that, started playing God with the genes and thought they'd taken away the gene that would cause the HIV virus. And their twins were born actually from that. We don't know what the outcome is if these twins will remain healthy and safe. So you don't start tinkering with the body that God made, the genes that God put together. Maybe they're okay now, but you don't know what's going to happen down the line from that. But you're right. This is one of the things in the future, genetic modification. Because think about that. If you believe in evolution, you believe we're here by blind chance, we're getting better and better. Well, let's help it along. Let's tinker a little bit with, you know, with, you know get under the hood and tinker that. And that's exactly, you're right, what's happening now. And we'll see more and more of that. But uh, again, we can't play God. It's almost like saying God's you know, creation here is somehow imperfect. And so they tried to, this guy tinkered with it. Now, if you know the story, 
The scientist that did that is, is persona non grata in China, and he's now nowhere to be found, nowhere to be seen. He's been, you know, the Chinese government denounced him for doing something like this, probably because they're doing it, you know, under the radar. They don't want, they don't. He made, he made it, he put some paper out and made a big splash about it. But yeah, that's happening right now, and so many other things going on. We could go into bioterrorism and all that, you know, if you want to start talking about modifying things. So it's a, it's a freaky world we live in, but the Bible talks about plagues and pestilence too, so we'll see that at the time of the end. And so, but tinkering with the human body, it's almost, can you imagine saying, I can make a, I can make a better human than what God made? Well, they don't believe in God, so that's why you had that. But yeah, that's a great story you brought up. I appreciate that. Well, and, the, and the, this dates back to, um, to Babylonian era, where, where those that were considered in the know, maybe they were shaman types or whatever, uh, there's evidence in Babylon that they tampered with, with uh, human bodies uh, f for sexual reasons. Women were tampered with. It's, it's known in, in, uh, in, during the times of Egypt. It's ancient. It's nothing new. But while you were talking about that, I, I also, I agree with you that for me, the night I got saved, a Bible prophecy message was being taught by Greg Laurie. And for me, this God, this God knows the future. He can tell the future in advance. Who can do this but God? So for me, it was, that's a, it was a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. But uh, Don mentioned Daniel chapter 2 earlier. And with your question, I'm wondering, I'm only guessing. This would be table talk over sure. coffee, right? Sure. No one's listening, just you and I are talking. That's Go right. Okay. It's, so Daniel, uh, verse 41 says, Whereas you saw, he's talking to Daniel, right. The feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. But just as you saw that the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another as iron does not mix with clay. And what's interesting to me is just the thought of I, uh, tamper with the seed of men. Um, what's going to happen? Is, could this be a reference to tr trying to change the order of nature? Uh, is this genetic engineering? God warned us that at, yeah. at Babel, Babel, that there's nothing that w will be withheld from their imagination. Speaking of humans, that we will push the limits to... I think, I think push the limits of our creative powers where God has made us with abilities that in some ways mimic him, right? God can write a song, so can we. No, nothing else can. God can express emotion, so can we. Nothing else can. Those kinds of things where we've been creating the image of God. I think because everything, in my opinion, that's being attacked from sex, marriage, Life, sanctity, all of it, I think it's right in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. I think the opening verse, chapters of the book of Genesis is Satan's target. If he, look, you may not, I don't know who you are exactly, but if you don't believe in the Old Testament or the entire Bible, just know this, Satan does. And if he, he doesn't have to mess around with the book of Judges, he doesn't have to mess around with Luke's gospel. If he can destroy the chapters one two and three of the book of Genesis, it's all over. the whole thing's done. It's all over. It's all over. Mm -hmm. and, and the greatest thing, prophetically, Genesis chapter one, verses 26, 27, and 28. Yeah. God says, I've made man, mankind. Male, female, I made mankind. What are we trying to do with that male, female? We, if you believe in a male, female gender exclusivity of the two, you're an idiot. What's wrong with you? You're so messed up. You only believe in two genders? Are you crazy? That's demonic logic, people. That's demonic thinking. That, that God has restricted us to a male, male, female. And the world is attacking that. So who's to say? I think your question is very profound. Yeah. And I think uh, anything can happen because it's not outside the imagination of man. Pastor Jack, Esther wants to know about uh, during the tribulation, the mark of the beast, who's going to be here, what happens uh, when 
who takes the mark of the beast and those yeah. that don't take the mark of yep. the beast. Don? Yeah, okay, the mark of the beast is something that we, we need to realize that has to, it could only happen in our generation. And here's why I say that. There's the assumption there in Revelation chapter 13 that this is forced upon the whole world. You cannot have a transaction unless you have a certain mark on your right hand or your forehead. Now think about this for a second. Can you imagine 50 years ago people thinking, how in the world can that, we're going to have monitors standing all around the world monitoring tra transactions. How in the world are you going to tell when someone, you know, well, today we don't worry about that, right? Tim Cook said the next generation of kids won't even know what money is because everything will be done electronically. Now, of course, uh, there'll be a mark on the right hand of the forehead. Why? Well, m most people are right-handed. What if you don't have a hand? Well, everybody's got a forehead, right? So it's going to be one of the two places, <laughs> right? All right? So, well, if you're alive, you've got a forehead anyway. But anyway, the bottom line is that's going to be uh, a mark that will basically say, I am swearing allegiance to this final antichrist, this man of sin, by declaring allegiance to him. Now, lest we, you know, I've had some nice people over the years, very well-meaning, say, you know, you got to make some DVD to leave for people. So when we're all gone, so explain what happens, the to explain DVD. the mark of the beat. You've heard that before, too? You didn't, oh, yes. You didn't do that. Did you make a DVD yet? No. Well, listen, when Lisa and I wrote our first Left Behind letter, there was no such things as DVDs. Oh, really? Yeah, I think in 1979, we wrote a letter and put it in our closet for our family who had been left behind if the Lord came for us. Yeah, really? We actually did. All right. So. But, but, but think about this, Jack. You've got the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. You've got the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. Then in Revelation 14, 6, you've got an angel traveling around the world preaching the everlasting gospel in every language on the face of the earth, telling people not to take the mark of the beast. That's right. I don't think they need a DVD by us, you know, to tell them what's going on at that time. But, but the mark is something that people will willingly take. It's not going to be, you know, right. it's not going to be something while you're sleeping, ah, you know, hit on you. They, because it's willing allegiance to right. this man of sin and, in a sense, also the worship of Satan in doing so. And it's the rejection of the God of the Bible. See, in other words, there's a whole package that comes along. So everybody that takes it is going to be doing it willingly and knowingly. Okay, and at the same time, there will be people preaching, saying, "If you take this, that's right. the God of the Bible will judge you, and people won't care, will they, Jack? They'll still that's take exactly it anyway." Right, Esther, you won't you won't be here, no. so you won't have to worry about that. But what Don, for me, I've seen always a correlation between what he just described as the Antichrist and this number and this. And the warning by the 144,000, exactly. and no doubt those that are converted Correct. by the... Um, in Daniel, in Daniel, it was, the edict was made, bow down to the image or burn. And you know the story. Bow to the number. By the way, it's kind of cool, right? The Nebuchadnezzar yeah. statue. Does yeah. anybody know how high the pedestal was that yeah. it was placed upon? Remember, it was an image of a man, right? Mm -hmm. And the Bible number of a man is what number? Six. Six. And how tall was the pedestal that that statue stood upon? 66 feet, the Bible says. Kind of fun. 66 feet, number six of man. There's this image, you don't bow. If you don't bow, you're going to burn. Well, that's going to, history is going to repeat itself in that, in that way. But I love what Don said. Thank you, Don, for the accuracy of it. Because what I'm about to say might freak people out. You will have to willingly take that mark. You will have to willingly take the mark. Why do I say that? Because you and I were sitting at Calvary Chapel back in the 70s and 80s yep. when people freaked out when credit cards mm -hmm. got a magnetic strip on the back of them. They never used to have magnetic strips. Mm. Pastor Chuck held it up and said, look how much we're advancing. And he said, well, you know, we're heading in that direction. Then the microchip came in. Remember the oh, chip? Oh, boy. oh my gosh, look how thin it is. It's in my credit card. We're going to get it in the hand and we're going to wake up one morning and it's, mm -hmm. we're chipped. We're chipped. <laughs> now your dog is chipped. Your cat's chipped. There's some babies that are born in Europe uh, where the children are chipped in those areas. Just because you're chipped, there are some U.S. Special Forces that are chipped. This has nothing to do with the Antichrist. Listen, the entire U.S. economy, believer, uh, 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 citizens, could be chipped and it has nothing to do with the Antichrist. Do you understand that? You need to break through that thing of, oh, no, it's a chip. I don't even eat chips. It's, it's too close to it. <laughs> don't think like that. You will have to say, I, I decide on his number to be the prefix to my number. 
I want him, I'm gonna, I'm gonna download right, I'm gonna download right now, I'm gonna swear allegiance to him, and I'm gonna get the mark, boom, I'm in, and you will have to bow and worship to him. So hypothetically, hypothetically, there could be 50 more years before yes. the Antichrist ever comes. Mm -hmm. And in 10 years, to stop human trafficking, drugs, and, and uh, illegal immigration, every American, everybody in North America gets chipped. You are not accepting the Antichrist. Do you understand that? Right. I'd go get chipped, and I would just go, and I'd, I'd go to work. <gasps> You have to bow to, you will have to accept his allegiance. Because people freaked over credit cards. They thought they were from Satan. And you all love them, I yeah. think. <laughs> well, you know, actually, Jack, it's going to be coming sooner, sooner than that. By 2021, the top 20 airports will have every face <coughs> scanned at facial recognition of everyone that comes in the top 20 airports in the United States of America. Not only everyone that comes in from another country, that's 100% of them, but anyone takes a flight out of the top 20 airports in the country, everyone will have their face recognized at that time. They're working towards that. I just went to Canada uh, just a few months ago, going back again, and you know, you should sign up, you know, you used to sign the card when you come to the country and fill it and hand it in. Now what do they do? You go up there and they take a picture of your face, they got that on the thing, your passport, and they got your, there you yep. go. So they're doing that, you know, Canada for everyone that comes in the first time. The United States will do it for all the visitors that come in, but also the top 20 airports in two years, according to this plan that they've got, all of us, our faces will be recognized the moment we walk through the door of the airport before we even get to the counter. I have an iPhone. Yep. You want to know how I unlock it? Yep. Mm -hmm. You yep. already know. Yep. I just look at it and it unlocks it. Mm -hmm. Okay? There. There it went. They just looked at me. So <laughs> but we're already there in, in some respects. It doesn't mean no. that you have bowed. No, not at all. Hi, I just had a quick question regarding Ezekiel 38 and 39 and how that correlates with Romans 11. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, it talks about the Magog invasion and the Persians and the other Muslims that come with. And, but afterwards, it describes that this is God bringing the people back to him. In Romans 11, it talks about how Paul references the branches that were removed and then how we were grafted in, but then God's going to start dealing with the, the Jew again, essentially. Do you think that this, this battle that takes place in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where God starts dealing with the Jew again, is an indicator tied in with, like, say, Romans 11 to the rapture time frame? Don, you go first. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things that why I argue I believe it happens right after the rapture of the church because God is now fighting on the side of Israel again, and the people realize that. That's one of the repercussions of Ezekiel 38, 39. It tells us that, that God is now working on their side because he supernaturally destroys the entire armies that come in. Yeah. Not only that, Ezekiel 39, 6 says he... God can, uh, destroys the command and control center of all the countries that sent these people here, too. So they know it's a miraculous thing. And yeah, so it's a switch over. You're right, from the church age to the eight now to the final, you know, the seventh week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation. The church, yes, I believe is out of here at that time because God is now working specifically with Israel right. and the people begin to understand that. Right on. I love, I love your question because it takes us back to the reason why we started happening now yeah. for doctrinal reasons. Exactly. For doctrinal purposes. That's where we sink our anchor. Mm -hmm. So your question is awesome. I do believe that there's a correlation between Romans 11 and Ezekiel 38 and 39. I believe that God will fulfill Romans 11 through or beginning with Ezekiel 38 and 39. I actually do. Because he does promise. And that church age, which we're in right now, um, that I think it's significant that the church was born by the Holy Spirit coming down. I think it's significant that the church is taken up by the Holy Spirit as his job to present us to the Lord in the atmosphere. I think that's key. From that time on, I, I believe strongly, I have to confess almost dogmatically, that from Daniel chapter 9, I could argue that the seven years of the tribulation period has to be Jewish because of Daniel chapter 9. Yes, they do. Daniel 9 says the last remaining seven years of that time is God's specific focus on Israel. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. And that would exclude then the church being here. Uh, 
the rapture is the only vehicle that we see in the Bible that separates the church from Israel. You guys, you're living in an absolutely miraculous moment. Yeah. You are living in a miraculous moment for this one reason. Since 1948, you've been living in a miracle because this is the first time that the church in Israel has been on the earth at the same time in human history. That's significant. Because when the church was born, Israel was under the occupation of the Roman Empire and was not sovereign. Now, you're, I believe we're at the end of the church age, and that's why you see the stirring as Don articulated tonight. You see the Jew going back, to, going back. You see the Jew leaving his native homeland, going to Israel to move. You see the prosperity of Israel. You see these things in alignment. What does that mean? That means you need to look up because any day now... Jesus could come for the church. You say, well, I don't believe that. That's okay. That's okay. Just know this. Those seven years are Jewish. Yep. That's why Matthew 24 is very they're Jewish. Very Jewish. That's why uh, Luke 21, very Jewish. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place where it ought not, come down from your rooftop and flee. And pray that your escape is not on the Sabbath day. How many of you live on your rooftop? How many of you would be hindered psychologically or ethically that your escape from the Antichrist would be on? The, why would you be concerned about running on the Sabbath day? Because you can only go 1,200, how many furlongs, like that, whatever yeah, it is. Not very far. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? It's so Jewish. It's so the seven years are Jewish. Very important. Me being 19, going on 20, usually I'm on social media. So I found out on YouTube, uh, BuzzFeed released a video describing how there's three non-believers talking about why they don't believe in God to a pastor. Um, and this is like a renowned singer-songwriter, Erica Campbell. And she was trying, just listening. So as of right now, and there's who, a... Who's the pastor? Erica Campbell. And Do you know who that is? Okay, anyway. She, she's a female R&B songwriter, singer. And um, as of right now, there's 119,000 likes and 5.2 thousand dislikes. Me, I take this as a negative way because we have three different parts, three different people describing about how they don't believe in God and most like people like me, have access to YouTube and they're seeing like a bunch of these disbeliefs. Then first seeing Christianity, they immediately think, oh, I don't wanna believe in that. Um, what would be your take on trying to counter these arguments and trying to tell them that no, this isn't how it's supposed to live, where yeah. you're not supposed to like live in these parts where you're thinking about suicide and you're thinking about all of these other yeah, uh, yeah. issues. Yeah, you know what? I don't know if you're going to like my answer, to be honest with you. I believe there's a direct correlation to, to suicide and the Internet. Um, I'm, I may be ugly, but I'm not stupid. I could actually go home tonight and get online, and I could fabricate something. I mean, I could get... I know enough spiritual talk... I could go home tonight and I could fabricate something and deceive thousands of people. I could say things online. I can even get photographs or manipulate photographs and upload them and completely bamboozle people. This phenomenon that we're seeing, I believe, is yet again another announcement that we're in the last days where there's... when. when when we were growing up and we read in a history book that something was real, we may or may not have believed it, probably dependent upon the teacher that we had. We were taught, if you're my generation or beyond, that you don't believe that. When we went to school, a teacher made a claim and we said, why? We were, we were in the ninth grade and we asked our geology teacher, how do you know the earth's that old? 
Today, you would be sent to the principal's office for rebellion or something. We were, we were recognized for being critical thinkers back then. Today, people make a statement and all of the non-thinkers run right off the end of the earth with it. And it's a perfect spiritual moment for somebody to come on the world scene and say, follow me, I've got the answers. And Jesus said that when that happens, the person's going to be able to produce miracles mm -hmm. that if it were possible would deceive the very elect of God. So when you say it's got a million likes and a half a million dislikes or whatever it might be, do you know that if I make a post and it's 100% true where this scientist who happens to be a non-Christian says, I murdered babies in the womb and I saw them squiggling and grabbing the implement that I was trying and I, to and I tore them out and put their parts together on the table. This is a doctor saying it. He did it. He said he did it. And people say, you're, you don't know what you're talking about or that's not true. And people will believe what they want to believe and people will not believe what they don't want to believe. And it's a very, it's a very scary moment because I don't know anything anymore unless I know this book. Because I can Photoshop something, right? We need to be, the answer to you quickly is this, we need to be discerning because I have learned what is on the internet or in the LA Times or in books. I don't like too many books after, after about 1910. I don't really like books <laughs> because it's full of baloney. So you gotta be so discerning. Don, this is a great question. Yeah, you know, the Bible says uh, not to go beyond that which is written. In other words, what God has divinely revealed to us, that's our standard. We stick with it. We want to study it, know that. Beyond that, it's only speculation. So we get questions a lot of times that the Bible doesn't say or it doesn't tell us specifically, and we say we don't know because it's only speculation. The Internet is one big speculation, as it were. Uh, when we get calls on the radio, when people say, they start by saying, well, I saw this on the Internet, we go, oh, dear oh, Lord, no. you know, what's going to happen? Because it's the wackiest things going. But like you said, Jack, people believe anything because the Bible says at the time of the end they're going to believe the lie. Second Thessalonians chapter oh. 2, right? There's going to be a spirit there that will cause them to believe the lie and take pleasure in evil rather than the truth. So we're seeing that right now. The Bible calls Satan, and I believe this is a reference to information, the Bible calls Satan the, yep. prince and the prince of the power of the air. Yep. Mm -hmm. I believe that has to deal with, with um, information. Also, you're 19 years old. Read the book of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. There's 31 chapters. Great. Read a proverb a day in the morning when you get up. Watch what happens to your life. Yeah. In 30 days, do you go to church here? In 30 days, I want you to come see me in the foyer or the courtyard and tell me what the book of Proverbs has done to your mind. Yeah. We're going to need to end, but we'll end with this. Uh, with this. Let's, all, let's all stand if you would. Um, listen, all of this pales in comparison to the real reason why uh, we're even here. And that is the fact that the God of Bible prophecy first gave his first, what's called eschatological prophecy, Announcement, and that is in Genesis chapter 3 when he said that from the seed of the woman would come one that would crush the head of the serpent. And that was announced to Eve, and it was in the context of regarding Satan and the salvation of mankind. And the God of the Bible who knows the future is the God of the Bible who lives outside of time. And he's written us this book that we think maybe if we're not familiar with it, that's just some old crusty book and it's famous and it's been around forever and whatever. Or it's actually a revelation of God's will and he inserts his will into the time domain of man. And he says, I'm the God, there is no other God. I am the God who knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And I declare things that have not yet happened from the beginning. The God that has authored this book is the same exact one who said, look to my son. He will be highly extolled, lifted up. His hands will be pierced, his feet will be pierced. And 
when I see the travail of his soul for mankind, I will be satisfied. And by his sacrifice, he will justify many. And so it's all about Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, the Bible says.